Hey everybody, this is Adam from Tungsten Amplification. Welcome back to my workshop. Tonight we are still working on the Dynaco ST35 point-to-point -point build. And uh, we're going to start off with a look at the schematic and talk about the preamp tubes. So as you can see, the Dynaco uses a 7247 tube, which is actually two different triodes with different gain structures in them. Um, it does this because it doesn't have normally a preamplification stage, so the first triode of that tube has got the gain of a 12AX7, and the second triode of that tube has the gain of a 12AU7. If we refer to the RCA receiving tube manual and look up the 7247 dual triode, you'll see it's a miniature type used for combined first and second stage audio preamplification in high fidelity phonograph or tape equipment. Tube has a high moo unit and a medium moo unit, which basically means that there's one high gain and one low gain. Um, if we can. So right here, you can see amplification factor of the first stage, which is unit number one. Sorry, it's a little hard to see down there. Uh, the gain amplification factor is 100. And on the second stage, it is 20 or 17, depending on the plate voltage. So let's come over here. We are going to be using the JJ ECC 832, which is also known under the American name of 12DW7 and the European designation of 7247. And if we look at the pinout of this tube, you'll see that pins one, two, and three make up the 12 AU7 triode. <clears throat> pins six, seven, and eight make up the 12 AX7 triode. So in this amplifier here, which is amplifier number one, which is done by the way, let's get the book out. Take a look at this beautifully constructed circuit and bring the light in a little bit better. So for these preamp tube sockets, each one of these will be an ECC 832 and has been wired accordingly. So, as we just saw, the pins 1, 2, and 3 are going to be the 12AU7 phase inverter side, and the pins 6, 7, 8 are going to be the higher gain first stage of amplification. So if we come back to the schematic here, you can see the input comes in. Normally it starts right there. Comes in through a 47K grid resistor to pin 7. You've got your cathode, which is pin 8 and your plate, which is pin 6, that is directly coupled to the input grid of the 12AU7 side with its cathode and its plate, which then couples out via the phase inversion to the power tubes. It's a really ingenious tube because it allows you to stack two stages of amplification in one tube socket that are quite dissimilar from each other. Anyhow, I just thought that was interesting. It's the first time I've built anything with the 832. Now, JJ also manufactures an 823 tube, which does not have a historical equivalent. This is something that they came up with, and it is the same style tube, but the triodes are swapped. So the 12AU7 side, instead of being pins 1, 2, and 3, are on pins 6, 7, and 8. And the 12AX7 side is on pins 1, 2, and 3, instead of six, seven, and eight. In this particular amplifier, I didn't really have a net benefit from using the 823 along with the 832. It made more sense just to use a pair of 832s. But if we go over to amplifier number two, which has not changed from when you guys saw it two days ago, 
the tube sockets are oriented differently. They were on an angle in the other amplifier and they're straight, where's my finger? Straight up and down there. And then this is the pre-amplification stage right here with one triode sitting here and the other triode sitting here. This is gonna be a 12 AU7. So because of the orientation of these, it made more sense to use the 823 on this side where I can access pins one, two, and three, which is the high gain side that we want to see first, as opposed to running these components all the way over to the far side. And on this side, it made sense to use the 832 for the same reasons, because I can come out of this triode straight into this triode instead of having to try to get to the far side and still have components running in the way over there. It's a lot of verbose explanation, but basically it was easier to do this way, even though it required me to do more brain work. This one will probably get built in the next two days, but I spent the last 48 hours working on this guy here. And let's just zoom in. Of course, the cathode resistor still hasn't been installed. I've decided to go with 150 ohm to begin. That's the highest value I have in that range. This power transformer is 368 versus the 335 that we expect to see. I'm planning to compensate for that by using a 5U 4GB rectifier and hoping to get 40 to 50 volts uh, drop, voltage drop. All right, hoping to get 40 to 50 volts worth of voltage drop from that rectifier. I would edit that out, but I just don't have the means to. So you're going to have to bear with my, my mistakes. So the power supply section was rebuilt, as you saw in the last video. I added the power cord today, gave the ground lug a dedicated bolt, which you're supposed to do. Nice long cable there. And let's talk a little bit about the circuit itself. The ST35 has kind of an interesting global feedback arrangement. Um, let's go back over to the schematic first. So coming off of one side of the ultralinear, is that? No, that's the, yeah, that is one side of the ultralinear tap. We come down through this 18 picofarad, which I connected to pin nine on my socket because that corresponds nine and nine through this 18 picofarad, and then we've got two different directions it goes. We've got this 27 K ohm resistor with a 27 picofarad jumper in it that goes all the way back here to the 16 ohm tap, which remember, we're setting this up for eight ohm speakers, but I still connected the 16 ohm tap as required because it gives you the amount of feedback that the circuit specifies. And then that negative feedback comes back to the preamp section as you would expect, ties to the cathode of the first triode, then goes through a 150K, a 0 0.22, and then ties to the cathode of the second triode as that feeds half of the inverted signal, the phase inverted signal, I should say. There's one side of it, there's the other side. It's coming off the plate, and of course the cathode is an inverted signal in relation to the plate, so we're feeding one tube the inverted and one tube the standard. Let's see what that looks like on the circuit here. So this is pin nine right here. Let me get some more light. Okay. So that's pin nine of a EL84. This is the 18 picofarad silver mica capacitor coming out. Zoom in a little bit here. That comes to the 27K resistor and the 27 picofarad one side of which is connected to this green wire, which is the 16 ohm tap off the transformer. We have this set up for eight ohms in the common. And then this brown wire here comes off this terminal, runs all the way down here, and it connects to, this is gonna to be tough to see, connects to pin eight, which is the cathode let's go ahead and come back to the schematic here. So here's that feedback loop coming through the 18 picofarad, and when it branches towards the preamp, it connects to the cathode, and also 
to the cathode resistor and also to that 150k ohm resistor, which is part of the feedback. So if we can get in here, let's see if we can get a good shot of it. So there's the 150k ohm resistor. And then its far end connects to this terminal, which also connects to this 0 0.22 capacitor right here. That goes into the plate, which then feeds one side of the phase inverted signal, and here's the other side of the phase inverted signal. We've got our plate resistors, the 27k ohm, and this, what is that, a 33k? No, that's a 300k. We've got a 33k cathode resistor on the second triode right there. Um, let's see what else we have. This black wire, let me zoom out just a little bit. This black wire here originates at the third filter capacitor, comes down here. This is feeding the plate voltage to the plate resistors. And because of space considerations, I could not put those plate resistors right next to each other. So I put one on this terminal right here. Where's my finger? There it is. Put one on this terminal here, which you can see, and then I put a jumper wire that comes all the way across here to this other terminal, and that's the other plate resistor right there. And that is the one, it's hard to see here, but that is pin six. And through that piece of heat shrinking right there, it direct couples over to pin two and connects the triodes directly. I did the same thing over on this side. And let me just zoom out a little bit here. You know, my goal was to have both channels visually and physically be symmetrical. But on the left channel, as you can see, you've got your power tubes here, and this terminal strip is to their left side. Over here, you've got your power tubes, and this terminal is off to the right side. And what that means is that these capacitors, especially this one here, that should be able to spread away from each other. In this case, in order to maintain the phase relationship between the two channels, I had to run this capacitor over here to this tube and then run this one over the top of it to the terminal strip so that I could connect it over to this tube. Um, otherwise, the left channel and the right channel would have been out of phase with each other, and when you hook up the speakers, you'd have crappy sound that would sound very hollow and low in volume. So as you can see, we've got the same setup on this channel. It's just a little bit more crowded when it comes to those capacitors. And then let's take a look at the additional preamp stage. Everything I've shown you to this point is stock Dynaco ST35. What I'm focusing in on now is my addition. So this here is a 12AU7 two-channel stereo preamp. We've got some 100K plate resistors, some 1.5K cathode resistors, 25 microfarad bypass caps, and some 10K input resistors feeding a 250K audio pot that comes out through these two wires into the grids. And then that feeds out through these 0.22 capacitors to the individual channels. Got our ground connection right here for the input jacks and the pot and the uh, cathode resistors and bypass caps. At this point, this is complete, and I have about a 95% expectation that it's going to work perfectly on the first try. I haven't gotten brave enough to try it yet. It's uh, late in the evening now, and I know that if I turn it on and something doesn't work, that's going to open up a rabbit hole that I don't want to go down tonight. So I'm going to wait until the morning before I turn this on, but I just wanted to share it with you. There was a lot of prep work that went into making this turn out the way it did. I know that some of you that aren't familiar with point-to-point -point electronics might think this looks like a mess, but if you've ever looked at an old Magnavox stereo from the 1960s, you know, this is decent quality work. I've seen a lot of those old console stereos and 
Some of them look like absolute rat's nests inside, but they are quiet as can be. They sound great, punchy, awesome dynamics. I don't see any reason why this won't be the same. I have very high hopes. Now, one thing that I should mention. When you're building a design that you've never built before, with the output transformer specifically right here, these wires coming here, I have a 50-50 chance that it's going to work properly and a 50-50 chance that these wires are going to be hooked up backwards and induce positive feedback instead of negative feedback. And if that happens, that means that this amp is going to squeal from the moment the tubes heat up and start conducting. If that turns out to be the case, I have to turn it off, unsolder these two wires here, the brown and the brown and white, unsolder the blue and the blue and white, and reverse them. So these two will go up here, these two will come down here. And then I have to come over to the other channel and do the same thing with these two wires here and these two wires here. Not a big deal. Um, I've encountered it in guitar amplifiers many times. Anytime that you induce negative feedback into your circuit, you take the chance that it's going to be in the incorrect orientation. Um, I could just go in if that occurs and change these two wires, but something about the OCD in my brain does not like the common going to the hot and the hot going to the common. I don't know why it bothers me so much, but I'd rather unsolder and move four wires than unsolder and move two wires in what my brain perceives to be the wrong way. So here we are. Amp number one is complete and ready to be bench tested. That'll probably be the next video, unless I just get a wild hair and have to build out number two. Oh, let's talk about the components that are going into number two. As you see with this amp, I used Mallory 150 capacitors and I used Mojo Dijon capacitors. Generally speaking, this is what you would find in guitar amplifiers. And I did that for a reason. I'm building these amps to a very specific aesthetic in order to emphasize the type of music I expect to be listened to on this. You know, the audio files are gonna roll their eyes, but this isn't the first hi-fi I've built. I've modified a bunch of Magnavoxes, I've used a lot of different types of capacitors, and I know exactly what I'm looking for on this. So on the number two amplifier, we've got some unique choices. These are new old stock Phillips. I think they're polyester capacitors early 70s maybe, possibly late 60s. I scored these on eBay about two years ago for a Marshall project I was working on and just happened to grab 10 of them. So four of them are gonna go into this number two amp in the preamp section. And then in the phase inverter section to connect to the output tubes, we've got these Russian mil-spec paper and oil capacitors, which I've also used in guitar amplifiers. They've got a nice glassy tone, gonna last forever. You know, really high quality parts. So these two amplifiers, in addition to having about, you know, 20 to 40 volts difference in their power transformers, um, they're going to have essentially completely different tone capacitors throughout. I don't think it's going to make a huge, huge difference. I expect that the number two amplifier is going to be a little bit more open sounding, and the number one amplifier is going to be a little bit more laid back, not necessarily muted, but a little bit more velvety. I think that the the number two amplifier with those paper and oil capacitors feeding the EL84s is going to be a little bit more glassy on the top end and, uh, you know, just have a more present response, if that's the right word. Probably is. So thank you guys for watching. This has been a really fun project and I'm looking forward to building the second amplifier. I will definitely post an update as that one gets moving and post another update when I get this one fired up. If you like this, leave a comment, subscribe, tell somebody you know that might be interested in this stuff. There's very few of us left anymore. Have a good night.